Okay, so as I said before, we are starting and talking today about directors and talent. So my first question for you guys to discuss and to kind of talk with each other about, since we're going to be talking about directors and talent, is simply, what is a director? Okay, not only what is a director, but whom or what is he or she responsible for? And now, as you guys are discussing this, I want you to appoint the person in your group, because you guys know which groups you're split off into. Um, I want you guys to appoint the person who is the oldest person in your group as your group speaker. All right, we're going to give you a couple minutes so you guys can go ahead and begin, and then we'll, be back, we'll come back together here in about two minutes. Right, cool, let's go ahead and come on back together. Which group wants to share out first what they think a director is and whom or what he or she is responsible for? Go for it, yep, what do you guys come up with? You don't, you don't have to stand up, you can do it from, have it from your seat if you want to, unless you want to walk up here, that's cool, that's legit. A director is basically a person or a person who tells people or who directs is in charge of a certain thing that they do. And Director's basically the one in charge and runs, this, runs the show. Cool, fair enough. And that's who they're, whom or what they're responsible for. They're responsible for making sure whatever they're running, it, they're running the show. Anyone else have anything else they want to contribute to that? Go for it. By the way, how old are you, Levi? 15. 15, so the oldest one in the group, 15. Okay, cool. Are you the oldest, Jalen? Nope. Okay, cool. Anyone else? Jordan or Celeste, since you guys happen to have the same exact birthday, like what are the odds of that? Who ended up uh, losing, I guess you can say. Okay, so Jordan, okay, so what did you guys come up with? Okay, good. Good. Okay. Good. Jordan tapped into something that we're going to discuss in the next lecture, in the next class period, um, the difference between producers and directors. Now, what I like to say is that producers are like God, the director is like the king or queen. And I'll, excuse me, I'll kind of explain the differences between those two when we start talking about things. But today we're talking about the God or the, or the, or not the God, we're talking about the king or the queen, you know, the director. And you guys kind of hit on it right off the bat when you said that they are responsible for like managing people and stuff. And that's kind of what a director does. In a lot of ways a director does manage people, okay? So 
The best way I like to sum it up is this. A director is a person who is responsible for and manages others in the making of a production. And the, in, this individual does it by controlling specific and artistic and dramatic talents. Okay, a director is a person who is responsible for and manages others in the making of a production. And they do this by controlling their, those other people, their art, uh, specific artistic and dramatic talents. Okay, this isn't just true with film. It's not just true with, with plays. Um, it's true across the board, irregardless of the, uh, the uh, industry sector you go into. Okay, so in science, you can have a director of biology. Right? You can have someone who's in charge of making sure that the biologists are getting their specimens in so they can study how life exists and study how life is created and what it's actually doing and so on and so forth. At a McDonald's, you can have a manager who basically acts as a director. Okay? They're responsible for people and man responsible for managing people to make sure that the food gets delivered out to other individuals on time. Right? They control specific artistic and dramatic talents. Some of these people have artistic talents or skills. Some of these people have dramatic talents or skills. There's a difference between if you're a people person or if you're better at dealing with people than you are dealing it with the, uh, better than dealing with the thing. Okay? So a good director finds the different people and puts them in their spot and their slot as needed. And then once they're in that slot, helps them be better in, the sl in that particular slot. Now, we're going to discuss and talk about what uh, the attributes of a great director, but one of the things a great director does is they don't tell people necessarily what to do. They actually don't tell people what to do. And I know that's really weird um, because it seems like that's how it should be. A great director manages people and puts them in the slot and says, here, this is kind of the area that you're supposed to work within. You figure out how to get it, get it in and make it better. Okay, where they want to pull and extract. They want to let the other individual do what they're good at, but they want to make sure that they're put into a slot in such a way that the individual that's good at the thing does the thing really well, and it makes everyone else look better as a result of it. Okay, so that's really the role of a director, and usually they're directing talent. And we're going to discuss talent in the second half of this lecture and what the talent's role is in regards to the director. But right now I want to focus on the person who does the managing of everything that was going on. Okay. Now, as we're talking about directors, I like to try and relate this back to kind of real life as much as I possibly can. Talked about McDonald's and having managers and so on and so forth. Clothing stores also have managers and so on and so forth. But if I were to ask you, who is the director of this classroom, who would it be? Okay, why? No, okay, I'm a teacher, but teacher isn't different than director. Because here's how I would define a, uh, how I define a director, right? They're responsible for, so I'm responsible for you guys. But then I also manage you in making a production. And I do this by controlling your specific artistic and dramatic talents. I find who's good at what. I place them in the right areas and say, show me what you can do here. Show me what you can do here. And then it's your job to kind of take over once you get dropped in the slot to go in, a, in the right direction. Okay. If we looked at a director of the staff on this campus, you'd look towards Principal Wager. He is good at directing individuals to their correct places. All right, cool. This looks like this individual is really good at film. We're going to hire him to teach our film classes, right? And then if I'm not doing what I need to be doing in our particular film classes, he'll come in and manage it. Make sure that I am doing what I need to be doing. Not, not telling me what to do, managing it. Asking me why I'm doing certain things, if there's problems or anything like that. Helping to, to kind of solve some of those issues and problems. Okay, that's what good directors do. Now we talked about productions, right? We haven't really defined production, so let me define production for you. The production is the action of making or manufacturing something from separate components. Okay? Humans themselves don't create anything. So as soon as you get to that point where you understand that you will actually never make something, all you're going to do is, is um, realign things that have already been made, right? It's first law of thermodynamics, energy, cannot, or energy slash matter can neither be created nor destroyed. Okay, all they do is change elements. Once you begin to understand that, it becomes much easier for you to figure out how to be productive in society because the word productive comes from the word producer, which is where we get our word for production, and it means to bring forth. So if you can't create anything, and there really is nothing new, you have to learn how to take bits and pieces from other things that you see and do 
combine it together and give your spin or your take on it. Bring it forth out of yourself, right? When you go and sit in a class, much like this one, the stuff I'm teaching you is not new. It's bits and pieces that I've gathered over my X amount of years, right? And I'm coming in here and telling you guys how, to, how it should be run based on my, my experiences and my understanding of the material. You guys then will take that and then create or bring something forth as a result of those things that I went out and figured out. And then as you grow up, same thing. You'll take from a bunch of different experiences, toss stuff together, and be able to toss it back out, right? If you're into acting, Shakespeare today is not like how Shakespeare was back in the 16, 17, 18, 1900s, okay? It changes over time because each time there's different culture that's added on, or different bits of culture that are added on top, different layers, and it changes the essence of the original thing, even if you had the original thing on hand, right? It's very difficult to recreate something for what it actually looked like when it was first, quote, created, unquote, okay? So each time we're in the class, we need to be bringing forth something. So right now, a lot of you guys are typing up stuff you're bringing forth notes. That's not really anything new. It's new to you, but it's not actually new in general. We're remixing. We're taking something from, from, from somewhere where we've learned. We're combining it with stuff we already know, and we're going to create something new as a result of that. Right? So each time a director takes charge and takes control of that producing and that production, that's what he's doing or she's doing. They're finding and figuring out what different individuals bring to the table and trying to get the best out of that particular situation. Okay. Now, if you have a good director, what you're going to try and do is you're going to try and set yourself up to where you don't even have to think about it a lot of the time. Your talent does what they, are, what, does what they do because you hire good people. Right? So that's what, a, that's what a good director does, and that's what they do with production. Now, who are some great directors? I'm going to throw eight of them up there, and they're all male. Okay? Um, and the reason why I'm going to throw up eight males up there is because typically the director role is brought on and taken on by a male. That doesn't mean you have to have a male be in charge of directing. There's a reason why men are better at directing than women. And we'll get to that when I start discussing more about, about production. Because you have to remember, I talked about how the producer is more like God, <coughs> the director is uh, more like the king or the queen. Um, typically, women are better at producing. And so actually, in, in a lot of ways, women have more say than men in films that are made. It's different, uh, the, and actually, technically, they're higher up in the hierarchy than than the guys who are directing. Um, but we'll discuss the differences between those two and why men typically are drawn more towards directing and women are typically drawn automatically more towards producing a little bit later on. Doesn't mean women can't direct, doesn't mean men can't produce. It just means that individuals are typically drawn in that direction for a particular reason. And we'll explain that a little bit more when I go into producers next class period. Okay? But here are some great directors. Steven Spielberg, 1980s, 1990s, basically reinvented the blockbuster type film with his buddy George Lucas when he created Star Wars. Uh, actually, Steven Spielberg didn't create Star Wars. George Lucas created Star Wars. But he created, they created Indiana Jones together, and they also did Schindler's List. Uh, Jurassic Park, as well as on that list, because in 1993, he did both Schindler's List and Jurassic Park. Big, major blockbuster films. Completely different ends of the spectrum. Spielberg is known for his variety. He can literally take any, any kind of story and make a good film out of it, right? Stanley Kubrick. Uh, mostly from the 1960s and 70s, known for his perfectionism. He still holds the record, to my knowledge, of, of having the longest production dates um, for a film. I think he spent nearly 400 days straight. Don't take a weekend off, just literally straight 400 days. So that's a year and probably a month and a half uh, straight for filming the film Eyes Wide Shut. Um, it's an extreme perfectionist in what he did. Um, but that's because he knew what he wanted, and he would do whatever he could to get there. And if other people weren't ready to get there at that moment, then he would wait for them. And he would consistently do it over and over and over and over and over and over again until they got there. Okay, it was exhausting working on Stanley Kubrick films. David Fincher, we saw a little bit of his, uh, a little bit of his work last class period when we took a look at The Social Network. Okay, that came out in 2010. He also did The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. He and uh, pr his producer, Dana Brunetti, well, at least he was a pr producer for House of Cards, um, changed the way we watch television in a lot of ways because um, when House of Cards was released on Netflix in 2012, they basically decided to release the entire season instead of one episode a week. And now we do binge watching because they said, why not just release the entire season? Let's just tell the whole story all, all in one go. Let people decide when they want to pick up and set down their book. 
right? Um, so he was one that kind of changed that stuff. Um, Christopher Nolan is someone we're actually gonna take a look at a lot today. We're gonna take a look at his film Inception, which again, we're gonna watch in here during second semester. Um, but not only that, we're gonna take a look at The Dark Knight and how he, along with Hans Zimmer, helped develop the sound of the Joker. Okay, because how do you develop a sound for a person? How, what's the process that that is like? Um, so he's known for Batman, Inception, Interstellar, Dunkirk, and he's working on his new film right now, which is called Tenant. Okay, um, he is uh, the most in-demand director in Hollywood, and he can decide which film he wants to do whenever he wants to do it. Usually he does his own works. Um, he uh, scouts out his costs, um, basically gets $20 million, no matter how good or bad the picture actually does. And then he also gets 20% of the gross. So if a film makes a billion dollars, he would get $200 million for, the, for that one film. Uh, Chris Nolan actually makes more money than anyone in the NFL or the NBA. And, and most of the high earning players do typically combined. Okay, because he knows how to make his films, make money, and also uh, hit, the, hit the targets, which in his case is the soul of the individual. Right? He, knows how to, he knows how to hit those marks, and he does it really well. Okay. Um, he is the reason why you had the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In 2004, actually it was really 2003, he wasn't quite ready to do his film Inception, so he decided to take on a, what he considered to be a smaller project, still a blockbuster film, but a smaller project, when he did Batman Begins. Batman Begins became a cultural success in 2005, enough for Marvel to say, I think this is the right time to start bringing superheroes back, let's, let's actually do a new film. Um, and who's, got, who's the best character we can work with right now? Let's do one that's closest to Batman. Let's do Iron Man. And so that's how they developed uh, uh, Iron Man, hired Robert Downey Jr. to play that particular role in 2006, and the film came out in 2008. All right. Next uh, four individuals, Spike Lee. He, uh, he did Do the Right Thing back in the late 80s, Black Klansman, not too long ago. Actually, I think it was like last year or two years ago. Um, very, very good in the way that he actually um, comes up with his stories. He has not had the best support from studios, and you'll hear him discuss and talk about that. Hopefully next class period, if we have time, we'll take a look at his relationship um, with Brian Grazer, who's his producer, uh, or who was his producer for a couple of films. Um, but he is notoriously specific in what it is that he wants, um, and um, has an eye before most people in the studio have that same eye for something. Okay. Francis Ford Coppola did the Godfather series. I don't really like to talk about him that much, but he, he is very good at more adult films that you would see nowadays. Um, you wouldn't have something like Breaking Bad or Narcos or anything like that without the Godfather series. Uh, Peter Jackson, who did the Lord of the Rings series. Okay. First person to take on not just one film at a time, but three films at a time um, and turn it into a successful endeavor. Okay, a very, very monetary lucrative um, endeavor, but also um, one that uh, is still looked at very, very highly today uh, with the Lord of the Rings series. And then Orson Welles, he did Citizen Kane, which is widely uh, regarded to be the best film of all time. Um, it is our current president's favorite film, uh, our 45th fifth president's favorite film. Uh, if you want to know a lot about him, go back and watch this film because it is about an individual who seemingly has it all, money, fame, fortune, but never had a childhood. And when you keep that in mind when, when dealing with an individual like our, like our current president, it makes sense why he does some of the things that he does. Right? Because remember, we talked about how your favorite film talks and speaks to your soul. If this speaks to his soul, probably in a lot of ways he didn't really have the childhood that he wanted. Okay? So I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm not trying to get political or anything. I'm just saying that's how you can find out more about an individual and know what it is that or know and understand how they make decisions um, and do what they do. Okay, so these are great directors that we can take a look at and take a look through. Okay, so then the question is, is why were they considered to be great directors, right? Of course, because they managed people well, they, they did their job well, but, but the big reason why is because they embodied everything about a great director. Okay, there, there are 15 attributes a great director has. And this is something that um, I, I, I full-heartedly really believe, and, and not just believe, but really know to be true. The closer you are to embodying these 15 things, the better individual you're gonna be, the more money you're gonna make, irregardless of your background and education. And not only that, the more likely you are to live in a community of individuals that love and care about you. 
And you'll notice we have a lot of that here on this campus. Okay? You don't get to become America's Most Spirited High School four or five times without having great directors on campus being able to direct individuals to where they need to go and what they need to do. Okay? There are many individuals on this campus that have passed up more lucrative offers to do what they do here because they embody this. And this was way more important to them than money. Why? Because the money's gonna come way later on down the line and they know that. So here are the 15 great attributes of a, uh, attributes of a great director. First, a director's gotta be a people person. Okay, if you're gonna be responsible for and manage others in making things, you have to be really good at dealing with people and understanding their problems and being able to get along with them in the good times as well. If you have someone who gets up in front of people and uses people as tools, as a means to an end to get their product, chances of those individuals wanting to work with that person again are very small. So you have to know how to not only manage people, but also get along with people. And then when you can't get along with those people, how you can still manage to create something good and be able to set that problem aside because you're looking at the greater good, as it were, right? The second thing is, is that a great director hires talented people. They don't necessarily play favorites. They have their go-tos, but they shouldn't be playing favorites with individuals. Why? Because if you start playing favorites with individuals, you might miss out on great talent. Just because you don't choose someone for a show or for a film doesn't mean that person isn't talented. What it means is that that director is trying specifically to try and find other talented people that'll fulfill that particular role. And then once they do find people that fulfill that role really well, they continue to work with those talented individuals and try and bring more talented individuals in. And then when those talented individuals need to go out and kind of do their own thing, awesome, cool. They can be replaced by another talented individual. Okay, so directors not only have to be people people, but by their very association, they will attract better people. Okay, You'll, you know these people. Usually the best people will have like the A kids around or like the B kids around, either, either in their adult life or even right now. Okay, those individuals are people you want to be around because they attract talent. Talent doesn't go where talent isn't going to grow. Okay, so you want to try and find good, talented directors. People that are good at working with talented people that don't treat people like crap, right? Third thing, they, a good director trusts their instincts. They have, they have a knowledge in their gut because they've been doing research for a long period of time. And so because they've been doing research for a long period of time, it seems to come natural to them to make decisions in, in, in particular areas. So they naturally trust their instinct a little bit more. Sometimes too much, but they, they tend to do things their way, not because a book told them to do it, okay? These are people that kind of know things. They don't want to be arrogant about it because the more arrogant you are, the less of a people person you are. You want to still trust your instinct though and try and get people to go along with you. Fourth, great directors know that film happens in the moment. And it's not just film, but just life in general happens in the moment, okay? Great directors, as much as you try to prep yourself way ahead of time, can't get either the shot or can't get the talent to do what they need them to do exactly as they see it in their head. It won't happen. However, if you keep changing the circumstances enough, maybe the talent's gonna give you something you didn't expect and you're gonna see what you wanted all along. And maybe the way that you wanted it wasn't really the way you wanted it, it was the way that the talent gave it to you. Right? Okay. Um, great director doesn't panic. Always under calm, uh, always calm, under control, cool, collected. Even when things start going wrong, like the internet this morning, if your teacher probably freaked out a little bit, remember the teacher's supposed to be the director in the room, if the teacher freaked out a little bit because the internet went down, uh-oh. Well, if you guys are the ones that are supposed to be the talent in the room, which we'll get to in just one second, how are you going to be able to follow that director if they're freaking out over the internet not being there, right? Do they not have enough material to back up things that they're discussing and talking about? Kind of gets you a little bit wary, right? Great directors aren't afraid to try something new. Always, always, always trying something new. Even if it worked before, doesn't mean you stay with it because the situation always changes. So you have to be willing to roll with the punches, right? They use their power for good and they don't have an ego because again, you gotta be a people person, okay? Next thing. Great directors make processes work. They set up a system 
in which their talent can do their talenty things, whatever that may be, whether it's football, if you play sports and you have a head coach who is your director at that point, whether it's basketball, whether it's a, a, a play or a show, whether it's activities, whether it's something in here, they create and facilitate processes that make things work. You let your talent know, this is where the end goal is, this is a checkpoint you have to pass through, here's where we're gonna start. And allow them to go through those processes. Okay, um, the good directors use a lookbook, you want to use and utilize a lookbook as much as you possibly can because some people don't understand just by talking, they have to see it. And so if you can show examples, it makes it that much better because some people are visual learners. Uh, they know formulas don't always work. They take inspirations from uh, current happenings. Okay. Um, they also uh, push the parameters much more than other individuals. They're, they're willing to take risks um, and they're calculated risks. They're not just risks just to take risks. Okay. They always give 100% and they find their own style and stick to it. Okay. You can find this almost all over the place here on campus. I like to use Coach Peterson as an example. Okay. Great director. Knows exactly what he's looking for. Knows exactly how to get there. One of the nicest guys you will ever meet. Um, one of the uh, brightest individuals you will come across as well. Will find a way to make sure you understand what it is that you're talking about, and even if you disagree with him, you still want to be around him because he's he's willing to learn and willing to accept the fact that he might be wrong, even when he knows that he's right. Okay, so to have that person as your football coach and to send students out on the field to go play a football game, you can see why people, why colleges and other institutions were looking at him to direct not just football but other things as well. Okay. He's very good at pushing the parameters. He, he definitely knows that formulas don't always work. He has his plan and he sticks to it as much as he possibly can, but is able to roll with the punches a little bit. And he has his own style and the way that he directs and how he does, he does different things. Okay. So finding great directors is a great place to start. If you're finding someone who is just kind of copying people a lot and isn't taking it and making it kind of their own, those are people you kind of want to stay away from because that means they're still learning and they're not, becoming, they're not becoming great. They might be good, but they're not on the path to greatness because they're not trying to carve their own path by following these other things. Okay, so as I said, as I said before, uh, we're going to take a look at uh, one great director. That's Christopher Nolan, who's still around. His film Tenet is coming out in July. Um, so he's actually filming it right now in, shoot, it starts with an E can't remember it's over near Russia Georgia right in that area I can't remember what it's called he's filming in another country Estonia there you go mm. <sighs> knew it would come to me um, he's filming his film Tenet over there right now um, but it'll be released in, re <coughs> released in July we're gonna go back and take a look at his other film Inception which took him 10 years to build he ended up having to direct three dark uh, three Batman films in order to prepare himself to film uh, his his what he would probably call his masterpiece, which is Inception. And we're going to take a look at that during a uh, second semester. So let's go in and take a look at how he went through that process and listen specifically to how other individuals talk about him and also talk about how he um, would, uh, let me see here, talk about how he would, let's see if it actually does it, direct them. Okay, because you'll hear from Leo DiCaprio, who's an actor in the film, and he's specific about how Chris Nolan wanted to uh, direct him. Okay. If we get it. Let me pause that really quick. Let's try this again. <clears throat> Take two. Come on now. Technology is great, isn't it? It's so utterly fantastic. This does not want to do that. So we're going to try this again. There we go.
Inception's a project that I first started working on about 10 years ago. I've become very interested in the idea of doing a film about dreams, about the relationship of our waking life to our dreaming life. The idea that has always fascinated me about dreams is everything within that dream is created by your own mind as you experience it. For a filmmaker, it's an ideal world to be dealing with. The script itself wasn't like he wrote it eight years ago and then it just sat in a drawer untouched. Every couple of years, at the end of every movie, he would go back to it and tweak a little bit and think a little bit more. Over the years, I tried to write different versions of this idea. I tried to write it smaller as a, as a smaller film. And what I constantly found was that as soon as you're entering into the idea of what can the human mind conceive of, what world could it create, you want to see this on a grand scale. The material demanded this very large scale approach. Inception certainly takes a lot of leaps in terms of the universal experience of dreaming. I, I wrote the script very much from my own experiences of dreaming and, and sort of extrapolating those. But there are certain things that we take to be common enough that people will be able to relate. The idea that you can't die in a dream. When you die in a dream, effectively you wake up. Things like the kick, the feeling of falling, snapping you awake, that seemed a very common thing, and certainly in talking to people, it seemed something that people really recognized. And it felt important to try and incorporate any of the really familiar touchstones of, of what it is to dream. Any of the things that, that are universal that could allow the audience to relate their own experience of dreaming to this rather you know, fantastical set of events. Chris often talked about this sort of Escher-like architecture world where things are built on top of each other in layers and this endless stream of creation. So in that respect, from a character standpoint and working with him, versus to say, look, if all these dream states are real to him, we have to treat them emotionally that way. In other words, everything needs to be emotionally charged. There were quite a few similarities in terms of what the filmmaking process is and what the characters and what the team of characters is doing in the film itself. They're creators, they're people who create an entire world for somebody else to exist in. And Inception is intended to be a film that tries to explore the exciting possibilities of the human mind and the infinite potential of the human mind. Uh, if for the individuals that have actually seen Inception and who can make out what you're seeing up here on the screen, um, this drawing is fantastic. It explains the entire film. Um, for most of you guys, you're looking at it and you're like, huh, eh, it doesn't really kind of make sense. Like, what's a kick and how's that going to go there and what's Yusuf, Arthur, and Eames and so on and so forth. Okay, very good uh, of Christopher Nolan to utilize a drawing, something like a lookbook, okay, to show people what he's talking about when certain things are supposed to be happening at different levels. Okay, again, you can kind of hear how, um, how uh, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio was talking about how if this is how it is to him, this is how we have to do it. And Chris knew that. He, he would bring in, specifically, talent that would see things the way he does and then add their own twist and spin on it because he knows that at the end of the day, he might not necessarily be the best person. He might be the best person to get it 95% of the way there, but this person is the last person, or this person is going to get the last 5%. Okay? So that's, that was inception for Christopher Nolan. Now, when it came time to make the sound of the Joker for Dark Knight, okay, things got a little bit, a little bit uh, more zany. Okay? He had to sit down and talk to... Let's see if I can find it. He had to sit down and talk with Han, to Hans Zimmer. Um, and Hans Zimmer was an in, is the individual um, who ended up making the sound for the Joker. And it's interesting to listen to these individuals discuss and talk about how to come up with a sound for the Joker when they don't necessarily know what that sound is. Because it's a process. How do you define a character with a sound? Um, this is how they ended up doing it.
the key new musical element for The Dark Knight was always going to have to be the sound of the Joker. Hans and I talked about it very early on, and I would send him stills and little shots of, of what Heath was doing to try and give him a, a feel of it. I didn't want to write a summer blockbuster, happy, indulgent score. I wanted something that was truly provocative and, and people could truly hate. You know, I made the conscious decision to go out there onto the edge. You know, that was the first step I took, you know, and, and the great thing about working with Chris is when I go, maybe I'm going a little too far off the deep end, he'll push me a little further. He would talk to me about the nature of the sounds he was playing with, this, this idea of sort of razor blades on strings, this idea of tension and, and extraordinary tension, just mounting and mounting. The idea of the punk influence that I think he had absorbed in the, in the feel of the character, getting the feel of that into the music. Without it ever becoming too punk, too rock and roll, too, too different from, from the rest of the music. I was trying to get it down to, to the most minimal thing that could say exactly what I wanted to say, so that whenever you would only hear a hint, I mean, you can hear a, a second of this thing, and you know the Joker's, you know, lurking somewhere. Hans did all kinds of experiments, uh, recorded all kinds of extraordinary sounds and bits of music, bits of playing, and I, I foolishly asked to, to hear demos very early on, and so he, he gave me this extraordinary sort of 9,000 bar long recordings of really complete insanity, and I dutifully listened to it all on the plane when we were flying from London to Hong Kong to go finish the shoot in Hong Kong. It took me most of the flight to, to listen to all of these different crazy experiments he'd done with razor blades on, on piano wire and you know, pencils tapping tables and floors and things. Just dip. Okay, so just to kind of put this in perspective right now, Christopher Nolan hired Hans Zimmer to create the sound of the Joker, create the score for the film, and then said, hey, I want to listen to it. I want to listen to hear there's some of the experimentations that you're coming up with, and let's see if we're in the ballpark. Now, he has to fly from London to Hong Kong. That's about a 10 to 12 hour flight. So for 10 or 12 hours, Chris Nolan was doing nothing but listening to what you're about to hear. Okay, most of us put on a podcast or throw on a movie, he has to sit in a big metal tube for 10 to 12 hours, and instead of going to sleep, he goes to work. Why? Because, again, great directors are going to push people, push the, including themselves, a little bit further. You heard Hans Zimmer talk about that, right? How when he thinks he's right on the edge, Chris goes, no, that's not quite it. Keep going. Keep going. Let's see what, it, let's see what we can find way out here. Let's go exploring, right? And pushes them a little bit further. So this is what Chris Nolan had to listen to for 10 to 12 hours. When fragments of different ideas, and there are literally thousands of them. This is from the early experiments. Wherever you go, wherever you go, there's mayhem. Okay? 10 to 12 hours, just those disturbing sounds over and over and over again. Imagine trying to pick out one and saying, oh, yes, that's the Joker. Right? Crazy. And if you think about it, for Hans Zimmer to create 10,000 bars, 10, 10 hours, 12 hours worth of examples and demos that were never going to be in the film to begin with to get down to one sound, it's a lot of work that no one's ever going to listen to or hear. Right? But it's because he's trying to perfect it. He's trying to get to it. He keeps on going at it, not because it's fun, but because he knows that he's almost there. He just has to keep going a little bit. Right? Eventually, this is what he came up with. And, and it was a pretty unpleasant experience to listen to all of it, quite frankly. It's a very unsettling set of sounds that he came up with. By the end of it, I had to sort of call him and say, I have no idea where exactly the sound of the Joker is in that 9,000 bars, but you feel that it is there. I felt he very much cracked it. Um, then it was down to him to, to find how to refine that into something that was actually practical to, to use in the, in the film. And now you're hearing it. This is the sound they went with.
tension. You know, I was trying to throw tension. everything away that, that you know you associate with, you know, the bad guy or something like that. I was trying to come up with a really fresh approach. And then really I took the idea of anarchy, you know, somebody who has that philosophy, what that does, and that fearlessness. And I thought, what if I can define a character in one note? Actually, it's two notes that clash beautifully with each other and make it really like a taut string that, that gets tighter and tighter but never breaks. Ultimately, it was the cello that did it. Take your time. Poor Martin Tillman, who's the cellist. I mean, I, I, I kept torturing him. I kept getting him back into the studio. Because if it sounded like he was acting, it wasn't working. You know, he had to embody that philosophy in a funny sort of way. This extraordinary, very quiet sound he came up with of rising tension that has a slight edgy sort of grubbiness to it, the slight ragged quality, seemed to sync very, very perfectly with, with what Heath was doing with the character. We went through days, weeks, whatever. I, I would write it out, OK, start off, you know, very quietly, get a little bit more intense. When we were doing it, you know, I could see the focus, you know, complete focus in Martin playing that note. And you can tell from the whole body language suddenly, oh, hang on, that's the one. We're there now. So you, here you have this, the lonely little cello note. And now slowly these guitars start coming in that bend it. But they don't, of course, they don't sound like guitars at all. I mean, if I actually play you the guitars by themselves, I think it'll be hard to recognize that these were guitars once upon a time. He's just playing them with a, with a piece of uh, metal. Now thinking about it, I think one of the keys was it had to be a very personal performance. And everything had to be very close to you. You know, it had to whisper in your ear more, more than scream. So I think one of the great things about the Joker is he draws you in. You know, he keeps drawing you in into the performance. He keeps drawing you in into his world. He keeps drawing you in into his ideas. What these guys found out is that what's scary is not someone coming at you and going, ooh, like this. What they found out was scary was someone doing this. Right, being quiet, because it's like, wait, what are you thinking? And it leaves the audience to make it up what's going on inside their head. Right? When someone comes at you very loud and fast, okay, cool, well now you can see it, oh, that's it, I can handle that. When someone's quiet and doesn't say anything, now it's like, okay, wait, what's going on here? And then now imagine those two clashing together in a note, and that's how they came up with the sound for the Joker. How much, how much more chaotic can you get? So it's not just an actor playing the role. It's not just the music director coming up with, with, the, with the note. It's not the director managing the two, it's all three working together in harmony to literally create a character, right? And so we'll talk a little bit more about, about the talent portion of this here in a couple of minutes. That's actually what I want to move to actually next. Um, but I really wanted you guys to kind of see what it was like to actually try and put something like that together. It's not easy. It's not easy to do. So what I want to do is ask you guys a, a, a follow-up question about the talent because, okay, we, if we have the talent doing one thing, we kind of have a musical director helping talent but still in creating things but also directing people to kind of perform the talent and then you have a director controlling everything in charge. What does it mean to be talent? So my question for you now, and I want you to take a couple minutes to, to sit back and kind of talk this over again with people in your group, is what is talent? What is the talent and whom or what is he or she responsible for? And this time, this time through, instead of having the person who is um, the oldest in your group answer the question, I want the person in your group who's most likely to get a million dollars to be your speaker. And for the person that's like, oh yeah, that's definitely me, that's definitely me, cool. I have a reason why you're going to earn a million dollars, but the three other people in your group or four other people in your group aren't. Why is it you that's going to get that cash money, right?
cool. All right, we're going to come back together. We're going to start with group one and then go to group two because I haven't heard from you guys yet. So group one, who is the one most likely to earn a million dollars for your group? I love it. Everyone's like, not me because I'm not answering this question. Who wants, who wants to take it? Okay, so not Nick, not Jeremy. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, bringing the director's vision to life. Good, fair enough. Definitely all the way through. Group two, what do you guys come up with? Who's most likely to make a million bucks at your table? Right? Okay, cool. All right, Kalina, what you got? Okay, talent brings a character to life. Why is it that you're most likely to get a million dollars out of this group? Legitimately actually plays a factor into it. Uh, um, do, you, do you know what you want to do after high school or no? Uh, I want to go to UCLA. UCLA to study? Like something in health. Oh, cool. How about that? Maybe she is in the right place, right? Hopefully. Hopefully her teacher doesn't mess her up, right? Um, <laughs> but cool. Awesome. Going to UCLA to do stuff in film. Sounds like someone on, the track to, on track to get that million dollars and stuff, right? And that kind of is what the talent is. The talent is supposed to have some sort of skill. Actually, let me just put it up here on the screen for us because that'll be easier so we can get going a little bit more. The talent is supposed to provide or is responsible for bringing a production to life. Okay, So they're responsible for bringing that thing that we're discussing and talking about, bringing it forth. And that could be through any type of video, even something as small as a TikTok. Right? You still have talent on there, and they're providing something, some sort of skills-based thing acting, singing, dancing, performing, something like that. Even if it's the worst skill, it is still some sort of skill because the whole point is to try and get your audience to do something, right? Remember, we talked about how a uh, video uh, is supposed to be made for a mass audience and that mass audience is supposed to, uh, to know and understand what point it is that you're trying to make, okay? So talent is required to bring that production to life. And they're supposed to know in which ballpark they're supposed to, to utilize that talent. And they're supposed to figure out how to bring that thing to life. When we do our announcements every single morning, it's different every day. Not just because the content changes, but the talent on screen changes. Right? Some days, you'll have people that need to stand on paper to be as tall as other individuals. Right? They don't have the, the natural talent that some other people have. <laughs> Kellen's looking around. Okay. <laughs> They, they might not have that particular portion of the talent, but they offer something else. They offer the chance to make people laugh and feel good in a very particular way. So that outweighs the talent that they may quote unquote lack. Conversely, we might not have, any, we might have two individuals that are the exact same height be on the show. And I know I'm just using height as an example right now. It's just because Kellen walked in, that's why. See you, buddy. Okay. <laughs> Bye, Kellen. <Awesome>. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you might have two individuals that are the exact same height, like today. We have Frida and Erica, right, on the show. Same height, almost look like sisters. Why? Because instead of just talking about what, or trying to be funny with certain individuals, with guys that are up there on the screen, bringing together women in, in like a sisterhood and to have people almost feel as if they can relate to other individuals, even if they don't know each other. Because Erica and Frida really didn't know each other, to my knowledge, until they came in here. Like they kind of knew each other, huh? That's yeah, yeah, they didn't really necessarily know of each other. But they felt like they did know each other. And we could see that chemistry happen in class, so let's put that up on screen and hopefully other people around campus start to feel that, chemis that same chemistry, right? So it changes depending on what your goal is for that particular video for that particular day. But talent, even if it's a squirrel on jet skis, or not on jet skis, on little skis that's being run around by a little remote controlled boat, right? Um, that, that's still a talent that's being utilized to bring something to life on screen, to tell us something about ourselves. That we like to waste time watching squirrels water ski. Like, weird stuff like that. Okay? So that's what the talent is supposed to do. Now, the talent could very easily let that go to their head. They very easily could be, look, it's all about me. This show would be nothing. Your stuff would be nothing without me because you need me to bring this to life. The biggest thing, though, that, a that the talent needs to remember, though, is that they are only one piece of that particular puzzle. They have someone above them who then has someone above them that is making sure that this thing goes off without a hitch. 
we want to, if we're going to hire you as talent and you want another job later on down the line, you can't have an ego about yourself. You can say you're good for this position, but who says you're good enough for the next position? Right? Just because you were the lead in something before doesn't mean you're going to be in the lead in something now. Why? Because different people are required for different stories. So what I want to do is I kind of want to review a couple of things first because I want to make sure you guys have everything on task. I want to make sure everyone's caught up. Whenever you see the word review up here, it's something that I've already gone over okay, in a previous lecture at some point. But it also means that, that the thing that I'm reviewing and going over is probably important. So if you see it in your notes, star it or something else like that, because that means I'm going to keep coming back to it at some point. If you don't have it in your notes, make sure it's in there. So we talked about what video is and how we talked about how the purpose of video is to demonstrate a point to the masses. Talent needs to be demonstrating uh, that point to the masses. If they don't understand the thing they're supposed to demonstrate, you start to have a bit of a problem. Okay, because the talent needs to know and understand what it is that they're supposed to be demonstrating to other people. If the talent is just supposed to go figure it out on their own, the chances of, them come, uh, chances of them coming to the same conclusion that a director has at, the same, at different times in different spaces is almost infinitesimally small. A director needs to do a good job of making sure their talent knows what they're looking to get. And if the director doesn't know, they need to do a good job of communicating to the talent that they don't know what they're looking for, just keep doing the thing and we'll find it. So the talent knows that they can go out and explore a little bit more, find more interesting stuff about, out about this character. Okay. Now we talked about how there's differences in analog video and digital film. Analog film uses, uses the subtractive color model or the CMYK color method where because it, it's actually printed out as opposed to being exposed with light. So um, uh, film usually is shot in 24 frames per second because it's less stuff you have to print and the human eye when they see it almost has like a warm fuzzy feeling to them. Okay. Typically weddings are shot in 24 frames per second now, and they're given air, or they're colored and highlighted in such a way that they look different from video. Because people that like wedding or like their wedding filmed, they want to have almost a filmic cinematic quality to it. Okay? Video is a little bit different. Video uses light to color things, so it mixes red, green, and blue light together. And you can speed it up a little bit more so we can have a better motion picture or a better moving picture. So we want to try and speed things up a little bit so it becomes even less perceptible that we're seeing a bunch of frames roll in front of us. So film, or sorry, video uses, uh, uses 30 frames per second. So if you want to know what those color models look like, we've looked at them already, but I'll throw them up on the screen again, just so that way you guys have an idea of what they look like. Here's the subtractive color model. You can see that you can combine yellow, blue, and red and come up with green, orange, and purple. And then you have like a tertiary color system over here for secondary colors. If you ever look on printing, uh, on printed package um, stuff, kind of like this water bottle or some other spaces and stuff, you might see these four dots, okay, it's to show people what it, what it actually looks like to make sure it's printing out the same colors that you're creating on the computer, okay? So you can check and compare by just taking a look at them. Computers use the additive color system where they combine red light, green light, and blue light to create other light. If you combine all three together, you get white. Okay. If you look at computer screens like the ones in the room right now, you'll see they're black until light is added to them and they shoot light out. You mix the colors together, that's how you create different colors on the screen. The smaller the dots or the smaller the pixels are, the more of them you have on screen, the better the resolution, the better the color looks. Okay. So that's the additive and subtractive color system. Now let's go back to talent and, ca and um, talking about what the talent does. Okay, I want to break this down by major video type. The reason why I want to break this down by major video type is so that way you know what you should be shooting for inside of that particular category. For example, news. News is actually made up of performers. And I'm going to get to the difference between actors and performers here in a second because there is a difference. The news is supposed to have the following individuals that are set as performers. They're supposed to be truth tellers. You're supposed to have news anchors, weathermen, reporters, interviewees. These are people that like you interview because they saw something and so that you want to find out more information about it. And sportscasters. Okay. On the news, if you want to know if you're watching a true news video, these five individuals will not give you their opinion about something. They will straight up just tell you what it is they saw 
or what it is they heard or what it is they experienced. Okay? It's a truth-telling platform. If you have an individual adding in their opinion, that changes it from being a news segment to an infomercial. Okay, infomercials are individuals, again, that we, we talked about when we discussed infomercials. These are individuals that are selling products. The products might be ads, it might be, it might be uh, utilizing news to, to uh, give people or their audience information in such a way that they like what it is that they hear. Um, so that way they keep coming back and they can make more money off the advertisements that are on the particular program. Um, sometimes they're selling the actual product itself, like Scarlett Johansson would do with um, Clean and Clear. Okay, acne remover, she's a spokesperson. These are individuals who are actors who get up and aren't being themselves necessarily, but trying to put a product in the best light possible. Okay, and this again explains your differences between your CNNs, your NBC, MSNBCs, and your Fox News. If you're watching or reading any sort of news article, it doesn't matter what the individual says because they are just reporting what they see as they see it. It's the experience. If you're watching a pundit show, like Sean Hannity, Rachel Maddow, Don Lemon, and so on and so forth, you're watching more of an infomercial where individuals are getting up there and acting a specific way so as to draw in a bigger audience. Because they're spokespeople for selling ads on their station so they can keep their job, or they're spokespeople uh, for, a, for a particular agenda that, a, that someone else above them actually has. Right? They're trying to sell a product, they're trying to sell a message. Typically, liberals go to MSNBC. Those in the middle kind of go to CNN. Oh, it's, increasing it's increasingly becoming people more on the left are going towards CNN as well. And then people on the right go to Fox News, right? So each different channel has a different demographic they're playing to. They're not, just, they're not actually reporting the real news, because if they were, it's just information as it comes in. Instead, what they're trying to do is promote a specific way in which to understand the news. And that's a different way to go about it. Okay. So you're going to get different talent. Talent has different roles. Okay. Music videos. What you're supposed to have for music videos are individuals that are, again, telling the truth. They come up with some lines, some lyrics, some music that speaks to a human soul, and they want to have a conversation with that soul, with that soul about something. Okay. So typically you'll have musicians in a music video acting out, I wouldn't even say to use the word acting out, performing their music. And then you have dancers performing a visual interpretation of that music and how it should hit the human body as well in the video. Okay, this is why in music videos typically you will have dancers and musicians. You won't typically have a story being told in the background with the music playing underneath of it. Can you do that? Yes, but now you're getting dangerously close to blending music music videos, and television and film. Okay, because when you start act, adding in individuals that are acting or, or lying, a I don't want to say the word lying, They're, they are putting on a particular show in a particular way, it feels that it's not as genuine, even though what is actually occurring is genuine. Now, sometimes you can actually tell more truth by stating a lie. Okay, you can expose more things about individuals by not actually telling the, the truth. But that doesn't make it necessarily better overall for the individuals involved in that particular scenario. Okay. Last but not least, in television and film we have actors. Okay. That includes actresses, of course. You have actors that are acting as actors. But then you also have comedians. Comedians' goal are, is different than an actor's goal. An actor's goal is to get an individual to feel a feeling. To help, to help the audience understand who the character is, and why they're going through this particular experience at this time, so that way we can understand the story as a whole. They're a bit in the whole. Comedians are a little bit different. Comedians' end goal all the time isn't to help people, it isn't to expose truth, it isn't to uh, uh, um, go or, ex or isn't to dethrone power, as it were. They can do all those things, but the comedian's goal is to make people laugh. If an individual is not laughing and not having a good time, the comedian is not doing their job, irregardless of what it is they're doing in the background. So if you see something like John Oliver's uh, Last Week Tonight, or if you see, um, um, shoot, what's the other show that used to be with John, The Daily Show with uh, uh, Noah Trevor, Trevor Noah? Trevor Noah, okay now. Their job isn't to tell you the news. Their job isn't to, isn't to expose things that are happening. Their job is to utilize things around you 
and make you laugh as a result of hearing about those things. Okay? It's not to make sure that power is kept in check. It's not to make sure you go after people that deserve it. It's not to help promote certain people in certain ways. It's literally to make you laugh. If they're not making you laugh, they're not doing their job. Okay? So those are the different categories of talent in the major types of video. There are more, but those are the major, major ones. That covers more than 90% of the individuals that you'll come across when you're creating video. Okay? So how does one learn to work with talent and do better at working with talent? First of all, you have to understand that working with talent requires great confidence and patience. Okay? If you don't know as a director what it is you're doing and have confidence in what you're doing, why should the talent go along with you? Okay? Conversely, if your talent and the director seems to be pretty confident what it is that they're doing and you're not willing to be patient to go along with them, you're never going to get anywhere. Right? So when you're working with talent as a director, be patient with them. When you're working, when you're working with a director, check their confidence. Or do they really know what they're talking about? This is why, by the way, some of you guys like to leave classes. You don't want to be in a certain class with a certain teacher. Some teachers really know their content and you can tell you just don't like the content. Like it's just not for you. Sometimes you want to leave a class because the teacher doesn't really know the content at all. And so why are you going to listen to someone who doesn't know what the heck they're talking about? Right? And who's just trying to figure it out day in and day out. Okay? Um, one must remember that in order to or in order for one's vision to be brought to life on camera, so if you want your vision, your idea to be brought to life on camera, you gotta be able to not only communicate well with others, but also command their respect. If they don't respect you, if talent doesn't respect directors, talent's not going to do what the director asks them to do. If the director doesn't respect the talent, the talent isn't going to do what the director uh, comes up with. It's not going to go with their idea. Right? I've seen so many uh, uh, individuals and in so many shows go downhill because the director thinks they know best and they don't treat their talent as anything other than tools to get what they want. Conversely, I've seen individuals have big egos that are in talent, thinking that the show would not be able to go on without them, not realizing the show always goes on, period, with or without them. That's typically what brings things down. And so what I like to do with this too is not just relate this to film and theater and, and, and other stuff like that. I like to re relate this to real life in the classroom, okay? Teachers working with students requires great confidence and patience. Right? One must remember that in order for one's vision to be brought to life in the classroom, right, one, must not be able, one must not only be able to communicate well with their students, but also command their students' respect. Right? If you guys don't respect the things that I'm talking about, and I'm not talking about good enough things, why should you sit there all day long and listen to me? Shouldn't, right? Because it's a waste of your time, waste of my time. Right? You, we all know those teachers that come in just work 9 to 5. Right? They come in, they kind of do their job, and they go out, and you're like, dude, this is the most boring class ever. Right? We, we know those individuals. Those teachers don't command our respect because it doesn't seem like they know what they're doing because to them, if this is second class to them, then it should be second class to you. Right? Same thing is true with parents and kids. Parents. Working with kids requires great confidence and patience. One must remember that in order for one's kids to live the life that they... Uh, want them to live, one must not only be, be able to communicate well with their kids, but also command their respect. How many of you guys don't respect parents because they're not communicating well with you and not having patience with you, right? Conversely, how many of you guys hate your parents because you don't have confidence in what it is that they're teaching you, and you also don't have patience with them because they're not trying to help you out when you actually need it, right? So you can see how there's a miscommunication there. It's, it's the same hierarchy, different areas. Same idea can be applied in many different ways. So getting this down is probably one of the most important things for you to be able to do in order to do well in here. Is know who your directors are, know who your talent is, and be able to respect one or the other. Actually, whoever it is that you're not. If that makes sense. Okay. Cool. So I have a couple more. Take care, guys. And good luck at your game today. Okay. So now, last thing I want to uh, go over. Okay, the two different categories of talent. Okay, last two slides and then we're out. Categories of talent. First one, the actor. I want to talk about the actor first. 
The actor is a person who is supposed to personify another, right? For some reason, it seems like a lot of acting schools miss this. And I, I personally have not been able to figure out why. I think they're, they're so um, stuck on trying to get new people in and to keep people around that they just kind of forget the basics. But we got to go back to what the word actor actually means. <laughs> and if you go back to the, what the word actor actually means, it's a Latin word. It means a gire, or it is a gire in Latin. It means to be another. So any time that you're going to be acting in, in a, a role as another individual, you have to stop thinking how you think and not approach it with your train of thought in mind. You have to approach whatever it is that you're talking about or discussing in such a way as that it's going to be felt out by whoever it is that you're actually playing the role of. Okay? For Heath Ledger, playing the part of the Joker, that meant for him trying to figure out what would cause someone to go so crazy and be chaotic and anarchistic. It's a great word. Can't say it. Okay? So what did Heath Ledger do? He locked himself in a hotel room for 28 days, for four weeks straight, wrote in a journal stuff that would never appear up on screen and stuff that had nothing to do with his lines. He had to figure out who this character of the Joker is before he could become it because he's trying to be this person. Okay? Ate, slept, and drank like him as much as he possibly could. This is a, a form of method acting, okay, where it's like you actually become the other person and you stay in that character until your production with that character is done, unless you know how to switch on and off. Okay? He would do this in order to try and figure out how to become the character. The problem was that in the, in the process of doing this, he began to slowly lose himself. Because if you're be learning to be another and become someone else, you have to let go of you. Well, if you're starting to let go of you a little bit, you start to have a little bit of an identity crisis. Because if you can't get back to you, and you become this other thing, and now you can't get back to you, and you're stuck as this thing, it's going to drive you mad and drive you crazy. Okay? Heath Ledger started to have nightmares. Couldn't sleep at night, because the Joker would talk to him when he was sleeping. Right? Couldn't associate himself with another individual. So what did he start doing? He started asking to be prescribed sleeping pills. Because he couldn't sleep. Kept them up. Did the production of, of The Dark Knight, things went very, very well. Things were done, but he couldn't look quite let go of the character. Okay? Sometimes the medication wasn't enough for him to stay asleep. He would still wake up, or he'd still have night terrors or nightmares and so on and so forth. Couldn't associate himself with something else. One night, he really couldn't sleep, took a couple extra sleeping pills than he normally would, caused him the overdose, he ended up dying. Okay? passed away as a result of not realizing that this thing was kind of becoming too much of him. He, because he realized that the role had to be felt out and that playing someone else means thinking outside of, your, outside of yourself, it got to him a little bit too much. Did he do it purposefully? No. It's one of those things that accidentally happens because when you go and let go of yourself to become someone else or something else, you have to learn how to lie really well, which is why, by the way, the best actors are the best liars. You want to find really good liars, they're great actors because that's what they do all day long. They have to lie to you about who they are because they're being someone else, right? So in a lot of ways, because he couldn't get back to being himself, it was difficult for him to process throughout his day, okay? If you want to be a really good actor, eventually you have to kind of let go uh, um, of yourself enough to where someone else can kind of pull you back. You have to go into this role and then be able to pull yourself back out or have someone else pull you back out of that particular role. It's better if you pull yourself out than if someone else pulls you out. Okay. This is why people, especially your guys' age, really get into acting, typically females, because they're having trouble discovering who they are, right? Trying to figure out and discover who you are. Are you this? No. Maybe are you this? No. Are you this? No. Because you don't really know who you are. You can't tell the truth about yourself if you don't know what the truth is, right? So you're going to spend a lot of time lying, taking on different roles, putting on more makeup, which, by the way, that's the reason why females do it, okay? It's to, to lie about certain things, not with necessarily a bad intention in mind, okay? but it's trying to accentuate certain features that you feel that are lacking, right? Because now you're starting to understand the truth, so you're trying to make up for it, and that's where you get the word make up, right? Make up for it in certain subtle ways, right? So you can kind of see how, how individuals can kind of get lost in that sense, okay? Typically for actors, their blocking must be precise, and they've got to be able to repeat this performance over and over and over again. Performers are slightly different. Performers are different. Here's how they're different, and this is the last slide I have for you guys today. 
performers are supposed to personify themselves. They have a skill or a talent, and you want to demonstrate that by utilizing that skill or talent. Okay, comes from the French word, I think it's parfineur, but I can't, I suck at French, so I'm not good at pronouncing it. And it means to carry through to completion. It means once you start something, you're going to finish it, no matter what it is. Okay, best performers, athletes included, are individuals that don't just do the minimum to get to 100%, they give more. We had an individual, an athlete here that was here before I got here, by the, by the name of Michael Norman. Okay, all national Gatorade athlete of the year, best athlete in high school, I think it was two years in a row actually, doing what he does which is running and sprinting. Now from the stories that I've heard and the, and the understanding I have of him as an individual, if he had to run the 100 meter sprint or 100 meter, 100 meter dash, he wouldn't run just 100 meters. He would run 400 meters the same way he would run the 100 meters. Why? Because just as everyone is getting ready to finish and strike their pose across the line to try and get to the end fast enough, he would just be 25% of the way getting started. So for him, he had a lot more strength than endurance. People are just trying to eat things out at the end. For him, he's just, he literally, it's just another thing. Okay? Exerts himself, gives a little bit more. The Golden Alliance. Okay? To get the John Philip Sousa award that they got, where it's like, uh, what is it, like the Butler Shield or something like that? Okay? There's only 85 groups in the world that have that particular award. Maybe one other high school that has that, that I know of. You don't get to do that with a bunch of people without understanding and carrying through what it is that you set out to start doing. Okay? So great performers perform constantly over and over again. They have a skill or a talent that is extremely good that they want to continuously show off. Okay? It comes naturally to them. If they don't naturally have it, it feels as if it's natural because they've been trained enough to where it just comes naturally. Right? And if you're performing and you're th the thing that you're doing has to come naturally, it means being real with yourself because you're just playing you. You're just doing you. Right? What you're exposing yourself to and what you're actually doing is real. So you shouldn't have to fake it in order to make it. Okay? I like to say great performers are great truth tellers and typically their performance is a one-time shot. They don't have multiple takes to go back and redo it. It's a thing they do and that's it. You can train, 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 train and that's how you practice but eventually you got to get to the thing and boom. You have to perform in that specific moment and you either have it or you don't. That's the reason why when we do BNN, I don't know if you guys know this or not, we record it live every morning. We go live at 8.30. People can watch us on, on Instagram or on Twitter, VMHS BNN, okay? um, YouTube as well. We go live every morning and the show is what it is. Can we go back and redo it? Sure. It's a lot of work to go back and redo it. You might not have enough time to do so. But the first people that take a look at it are, are, are parents. It's not students. Why? Because we want to make sure that we're telling the truth and performing for them first, you guys second, the community third. Because the parents are the ones that are paying basically for people to be here. If they don't like what's going on, we want to make it better. Right? So. That's the reason why we try to typically go live. We could edit stuff, but if there's flaws and stuff, people are going to point them out more obviously. If we do it live, we're like, well, okay, we did our best we could with what we had at that particular time. Were there mistakes? Yes, we'll fix them up, shore them up for next time. Right? So that's the difference between performing and acting. Now, what's really interesting is sometimes you hear about an actor who has a great performance. It means they were so good at the lie, you couldn't even tell they were doing that thing. This is like Tom Hanks as Forrest Gump. Name someone else who can play the role of Forrest Gump, right? You, you almost can't. Like, Forrest Gump is Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks is Forrest Gump, right? If you think about your, uh, the Joker, right? No one has been able to do it since. Heath Ledger. Heath Ledger is the Joker. Jack Nicholson has his version of the Joker, but like you guys, Heath Ledger is the Joker, the Joker is Heath Ledger. The performance was so good, you couldn't even tell that that, that individual was acting because it just felt so real. And that's how you, as an actor, train yourself to be better. You get so good at the lying that it appears to be true, and people believe it to be true. And that's how you have a stellar or outstanding performance. That's the reason why we give out acting awards for performing, not for acting. Okay? So <clears throat> that's the difference between all of that stuff. And I think that's pretty much all I have for you today.